For much of the world in the early 1940s, the face of Adolf Hitler came to personify true evil itself. Looking into Nazi Germany from the outside perspective, it seemed as though Adolf Hitler had an almost hypnotic grip on his people in every level of German society. And yet, the closest he ever came to being assassinated was not part of some allied plot, but instead came from men who as serving soldiers in the German army had pledged their unconditional support to him. This is the story of Operation Valkyrie, the plot by the German army to kill Hitler with a bomb. A plot that very nearly succeeded. Much has been written about the cult of Adolf Hitler and the neo-fantasism many of his followers possessed when it came to their Führer and his dream of a racially pure, economic and military superpower in the form of Nazi Germany. German and even allied propaganda helped fuel the belief that the German people had embraced the Nazi party and was one unified nation devoted to fascism. However, if one were to scratch away the surface of this belief even just slightly, German resistance to Hitler and the Nazi party was more widespread than was generally believed in the years leading up to and during the Second World War. When Hitler became Chancellor on January 30th, 1933, Germany was bordering on civil war as political ideologies spilled out from government factitions into open violence on the streets. And one of the biggest culprits of this violence were Nazi supporters. The paramilitary wings of the Nazi party, the Sturmabteilung or SA, and the Schutzstaffel or SS, waged the Nazi party's campaigns to suppress opposition groups, in particular amongst the Communist Party. The SA was seen as something of a blunt instrument in defending Nazi ideals. Being comprised of ruffians and thugs who often got into physical altercations with anyone who voiced opposition to Hitler, However, the real fear of the Nazis lay with the SS under Heinrich Himmler and his secret police forces. While technically under the authority of the SA, the SS were their own force intended to protect Hitler himself. While embodying both the political ideology and the perceived generic purity of the Nazi elite, having achieved power and suppressed much of the organized political resistance to the Nazi party, the next serious threat to Hitler came from the SA itself. Despite their loyalty to the Nazis and all they had done to further Hitler's rise to power, they found themselves being increasingly sidelined by the SS, which was still supposed to be subordinate to the SA leadership. Hitler, Himmler and the SS suddenly found themselves the focus of the SA's frustration and anger, leading Hitler to turn to his loyal SS to take care of the problem. On June 30th, 1934, the SS under Himmler began rounding up leading members of the SA, many of whom were executed while the organization itself was disbanded. Remembered as the Night of the Long Knives, the purge not only took care of the problem with the SA, but also served as a warning that with Himmler and the SS at his side, no one was free from Hitler's vengeance if you were to ever become an opponent to the Nazis. On the opposite side of the coin, the standing of the SS with Hitler only grew further, as did their standing within Nazi Germany, but Hitler now began to see the German army as a threat. In the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, the German armed forces were decimated compared to even their pre-war levels. The army was only allowed 100,000 men, and even then they were restricted to what types of weaponry they used, and when and where they could operate. Nevertheless, it was still a very real threat to Hitler, with its officer corps still largely comprising of men from Imperial Germany's aristocracy and ruling class, many of whom still viewed him as nothing more than a jumped up little corporal. They were also still bound by their oath to Germany's post-war constitution, 
which recognized Paul von Hindenburg as the president of Germany, despite this position being eroded by the Nazis. Then on August 2nd, 1934, barely a month after the Night of the Long Knives, Hindenburg succumbed to lung cancer and passed away. Within hours, Hitler had absorbed the role of head of state and made the army swear a new oath, pledging alliance to him alone as the true leader of Germany. With Hindenburg dead, the role of president dissolved and the army now swearing their alliance, there was no longer any legal way of removing Hitler who assumed the title of Führer of Nazi Germany. Of the opponents to the new regime, who managed to conceal their angst from Himmler's secret police force, most simply fell silent or were even converted to the Nazi cause as Hitler rebuilt Germany's armed forces and began reclaiming lost territory, which saw his popularity with the wider public soar. There were always those who still dissented, but their voices were barely a whisper compared to the opera of Nazi German society centered around Hitler. Even then, that society knew he was leading them to war yet again. The military leadership of Germany were cautious about antagonizing the same allies who had defeated them in the previous war with Hitler's expansionist policies. They knew, while they were reaming on paper at least, the German forces were at a distinct numerical and often qualitative disadvantage compared to Britain and France. However, encouraged by London and Paris's appeasement of German expansion through the 1930s, Hitler decided to strike against Poland, believing that again Britain and France would again do nothing. This time he was wrong and war was declared. However, the fears that many of the German military had of waging another large-scale war in Europe at that time were quickly dispelled. Within a year of invading Poland, Hitler's armies had subdued most of Western Europe and the German air force, the Luftwaffe, was in the midst of softening up Britain, ready for invasion. It seemed like the Führer could do no wrong. However, as Germans began to feel their military was unstoppable, an ominous sound rang out over Berlin on the night of August 25th, 1940. It was the sound of air raid sirens. In retaliation for the Luftwaffe bombing London, British Royal Air Force bombers attacked Tempelhof Airport in the German capital. The German planes had bombed London by mistake, but the British didn't know this, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered more attacks on targets in the capital. The British bombers were operating at the extreme of their ranges, and the damage done was only light, but Hitler was enraged and demanded vengeance. Believing that Britain's fighter forces were all but finished, he ordered that his bombers turn their attention to London and other British cities to terrify the British population into demanding surrender, making an invasion unnecessary. However, many in the German military leadership disagreed. They wanted to keep the pressure on the RAF and annihilate it completely so they could cross the channel before the winter weather interfered. But Hitler would not be swayed and so when Londoners suffered, they bought the RAF precious time to rebuild and reorganize and thus keep Britain in the fight. The Battle of Britain ended with Germany's forces being contained on the continent and Britain still in the fight and it was thanks largely to Hitler's interference. Hitler now ordered his navy to lay siege to Britain while his army went to the aid of his Italian ally Mussolini in North Africa where British Empire forces were pushing his troops back across Libya. In the coming year, German troops would expand through the Balkans and into Greece, swelling Nazi Germany's power further. However, the unfinished business of defeating Britain in the summer of 1940 meant that time and time again, RAF bombers were visiting German targets at night. The Germans themselves believed in the effectiveness of terror bombing to such an extent that they feared RAF raids might achieve the same level of terror amongst their own population leading to a breakdown of civil obedience. They also feared what might happen if the many millions of forced labor imported into Germany from occupied lands were to rise up against their oppressors. And so German General Frederick Ulbrich began formulating a plan that would use Germany's reserve army on the home front to re-establish and maintain order. Dubbed Operation Valkyrie, 
the plan was designed to ensure the continuity of the Nazi government. If such a crisis should occur, and was signed off by Hitler himself. Little did Hitler know, he was effectively signing the blueprint for a coup against him, which if successful, would see him killed. Born into German nobility on November 15, 1907, when Imperial Germany was approaching the zenith of its power, Klaus von Stauffenberg was raised on stories of noble German families, with their sons serving in the military and demonstrating notions such as honour and chivalry. Thus, a career in the German army was always on the cards for the young Klaus, even as Germany was forced to accept the guilt of starting the First World War and all the restrictions the armistice placed upon it. In 1926, he joined the German Army's 17th Cavalry Regiment in Bamberg, which was the traditional unit for the members of the von Stauffenberg family to serve within. At that time, Germany was in a state of upheaval, as forces on both sides of the political spectrum were vying for power. But the young von Stauffenberg clung to his old ideals, that the German officer corps was a stabilizing influence on the state, even as many of his class and social status were slowly being swayed towards the right wing, where the Nazis were waiting to recruit them. Eventually, he would voice support for Hitler in the 1932 elections, and his support for curtailing the Jewish influence over German society. However, his support for Hitler once the Nazis were in power quickly wavered. Being a devout Catholic, conflicted with his sense of nationalism, particularly when it came to the treatment of Jews. Again, he did support the restricting of the Jewish influence on Germany, but when he saw Jewish property being destroyed and the levels of violence inflicted on the Jews by the SA and SS, he was appalled as it violated his sense of morality. Nevertheless, he was not yet willing to oppose Hitler openly. He was now married and had his own family to consider also, Hitler's popularity was growing as Germany rebuilt under his leadership, making opposition all the more difficult. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, von Stauffenberg was not only at the front of the fighting with his regiment, but openly supported the German colonization of Eastern European countries and the utilization of its people in achieving Germany's destiny. As Poland was being absorbed into Germany, Von Stauffenberg was approached by the growing resistance to Hitler amongst Germany's upper echelons, which included his uncle to join their ranks. However, while Poland had been suppressed, Germany was now at war with two worthy opponents in the form of Britain and France, and he felt it was his duty to defend his country even if he was opposed to its leader. During the subsequent battle for France, his leadership skills were recognized by his superiors, and he was given a position amongst the general staff of the 6th Panzer Division. The following year, despite Britain remaining undefeated over German troops, fighting in the Balkans and in North Africa, Hitler decided to strike against the Soviet Union. Many of Hitler's generals were opposed to the move at the time, knowing a war with the Soviet Union would require a huge amount of resources much of which were needed in the aforementioned theatres of the war, Hitler would not listen. He believed that he had to strike now before the German people lost their appetite for war. He also believed that despite its size, the Soviet Union was so weak that in his words, we have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. Being the loyal German officers they were, the generals nonetheless obeyed their Fuhrer and on June 22, 1941, the German army launched the largest military campaign in history, involving some 3 million German and Axis forces. In the opening months, German forces swept away Soviet resistance so quickly that often their own supply chain couldn't keep up. Hitler appeared to have been proven right yet again, but the advance then slowed over the harsh Soviet winter, as if this were not enough. In December 1941, Hitler, acting without consulting his senior officers, opened up yet another front, this time against the United States, in support of Japan. 
Hitler had now led Germany into a global war against three major superpowers, which many officers knew was almost unwinnable unless the Soviet Union could be crushed in the following spring, affording Germany a wealth of labour and resources. In the meantime, the German army generals began to receive reports about the activities of the SS under Heinrich Himmler. Mass shootings of Jews and gypsies were taking place across the occupied lands, much to the disapproval of men such as von Stauffenberg, who still clung to the virtues of German nobility. Slowly, he could no longer keep his opinions of Hitler to himself, and being isolated from Himmler's SS and Gestapo spies at the front, he openly criticised the Führer and the butchering of innocent civilians regardless of how he personally felt about them. As a Catholic, von Stauffenberg believed that regardless of who was leading his country, he would one day have to answer to a higher power, and being complicit in such activities would ultimately lead to his damnation. In November 1942, von Stauffenberg found himself being promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and was transferred away from Russia to join the Africa Corps under Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. By that time, American and Free French forces had joined British and Commonwealth forces in the fight against the Germans and Italians. He arrived in Tunisia just as Rommel launched a major counter-offensive against the inexperienced American forces. Despite early successes, the counter-offensive was halted and the Germans were back on the defensive, when on April 7, 1943, von Stauffenberg was travelling in a staff car when it was shot up by Royal Australian Air Force fighter bombers. Severely injured, he lost his left eye, his right hand and two fingers on his left hand. Spending three months in a hospital in Munich, he heard how Hitler had refused to let beleaguered German troops at Stalingrad surrender when all hope was lost, and then how an ungrateful Führer left the Africa Corps to disintegrate, not having any interest in them anymore. For Klaus von Stauffenberg, there was no choice anymore. Hitler had to be removed. The Führer had to die. Having refused previous efforts to recruit him into the growing conspiracy against Hitler, von Stauffenberg knew who to turn to in order to play his part. Fellow conspirators included Ludwig Beck, the former chief of the army general staff who had been tricked into retirement by Hitler before the invasion of Poland, after the two of them had fallen out over Hitler's expansionist policies. Whilst in this enforced retirement, he recruited supporters for his conspiracy against Hitler and even made secret communications with Britain via the Pope in Rome. Another important figure in the conspiracy was Colonel General Friedrich Aldbricht, the man who had helped conceive of the Valkyrie contingency plan, which he and the others were now adapting into their takeover plan, since the principles of it remained unchanged. The Führer was going to be removed from the picture, as was his supporters, while the reserve army would help secure the replacement government. However, perhaps the most important member of the conspiracy was Major General Henning von Tresco, Chief Operations Officer of Army Group Center fighting the Soviets on the Eastern Front. Even before von Stauffenberg was wounded in Africa, von Tresco had been instrumental in orchestrating an assassination attempt on Hitler as he visited his field headquarters on the Eastern Front near Vinitsa in modern-day Ukraine between February 19th and March 13th, 1943. Von Tresco weighed up several options for killing Hitler during his visit, including organising an ambush of him and his SS security by anti-Nazi troops. However, in the end, he settled on smuggling a bomb onto the Führer's plane as it departed on March 13th. With a 30-minute timer, the bomb was expected to detonate while the plane was still close to the front lines, so the Führer's death could be attributed to Soviet fighters intercepting his plane. Meanwhile, Aldbrecht would instigate Operation Valkyrie and seize control of the government. However, the bomb failed to detonate and the Führer's plane landed back in Germany without interruption. There was also two efforts made to kill Hitler with volunteers wearing suicide vests, but these were either unsuccessful or cancelled. 
While failing in their objective, it did allow the conspirators more time to fine-tune their plan for taking over the Third Reich. They knew it was not enough to kill Hitler, as he still had strong support, so Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring would also have to be quickly dealt with. With Hitler dead, the regular army would be freed from their oath of alliance, but would have to be swayed quickly to support the new regime in order to overpower the SS, who would no doubt remain fanatically loyal to the Nazi ideology. Key government positions would then be allocated to anti-Nazis, including some of the conspirators themselves, with Beck slated to take a position akin to the head of state. Then there was the war situation. The conspirators decided that once in power, they would seek peace with the Western allies to allow themselves to concentrate all their efforts on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union, with whom it was agreed there could be no negotiation. Exact details of what they would offer the Western allies to negotiate peace remains unclear. However, most agree that this was an unrealistic aim. By late 1943, the Western Allies had defeated Germany in Africa and were pushing through Italy, while their air power was seriously hampering Germans' ability to manufacture weapons of war. By mid-1944, the Western Allies were preparing to storm Fortress Europe itself, with the D-Day landings, and all of this was to say nothing of the slow but steady progress the Soviet army was making in the East. The conspirators were banking on the capitalist West to let Germany and the Soviets fight it out, weakening both, but they overlooked the fact that the West was fully geared up to destroy Germany and had every intention of doing so, if for nothing else, to keep Germany from surviving, rebuilding and possibly starting a third world war 20 years later. There was to be no negotiating peace that didn't involve Germany's complete surrender, regardless of who was in charge. Nevertheless, the conspirators clung to the hope that they could at least spare Germany from the Führer's almost suicidal desire for total war. But with several failed attempts already behind them, the question was how. An opportunity soon presented itself in the summer of 1944, by which time the Western Allies had established their beachhead in Normandy. Hitler, Himmler and Göring were scheduled to attend a conference at the so-called Wolf's Lair headquarters in Rastenburg, East Prussia, in July. Another visitor would be the opposed Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. Included in the conference was Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, and thus he was perfectly placed to set the bomb. But they had to move quickly. The conspirators learned that the Gestapo were moving in on them. In the days leading up to July 20th, von Stauffenberg attempted to place a briefcase containing two explosives in the vicinity of the three Nazi leaders, However, each time, one or more of them left the targeted room, forcing von Stauffenberg to call off the attempt. With time running out, they elected to prioritize Hitler as the target, and they would deal with the others later if they had to. That morning, von Stauffenberg arrived for the conference scheduled at 12.30 hours, again carrying the bombs in his briefcase. Before the conference was due to begin, he had to set the timers for the fuses and was nearly caught doing so when a guard came looking for him to hurry up. As a result, he only had time to arm one of the two explosives. Von Stauffenberg was then told that the location of the conference had been changed from the underground Führer bunker to a wooden hut outside, as Hitler had found the summer heat in the bunker unbearable. Before the meeting began, von Stauffenberg asked to be sat as close to Hitler as possible claiming his hearing had been affected by his injuries, although of course, this was to get the bombs as close to Hitler as possible. Once in the room, von Stauffenberg delicately placed the explosive under the table near where Hitler was positioned and waited for the pre-arranged phone call to come that would allow him to leave the room without suspicion. The call came and he made his exit. A short while later, the wooden hut was rocked by a violent explosion that after witnessing, von Stauffenberg was certain the Führer was dead. There was no time to waste. Von Stauffenberg quickly drove to a nearby airfield and flew back to Germany to put the plan into action. He and the others were in the process of organizing their takeover when news reached them that must have made their hearts sink into their stomachs. Hitler was not only alive, but well enough that he had attended a meeting with Mussolini later that very day. But how? 
several factors came into play that ultimately spared the Fuhrer's life. Firstly, von Stauffenberg was unable to arm the second bomb, which would have doubled the explosive force, and may have been enough to kill Hitler. It was also learned that after von Stauffenberg had left the room, the briefcase had been moved from its prime location to a position behind one of the large oak legs of the table the Fuhrer was gathering around, thus shielding Hitler from much of the blast. Finally, the relocating of the meeting from the reinforced bunker to the wooden hut meant that instead of the explosive force being contained within the thick concrete walls, much of it was allowed to escape through the windows and wooden walls, thus diminishing its impact on the people inside and making the blast look more devastating to von Stauffenberg than it really was. Out of 24 people all in one room with a bomb going off, only four were killed. With their plans underway, their cover was gone and the SS quickly moved in on them. There was a brief shootout between the conspirators and the SS in Berlin, in which von Stauffenberg was injured in the shoulder before they were overpowered and captured. In the opening hours of the following morning, with the truck's headlights illuminating the scene, the executions began. When it was Klaus von Stauffenberg's turn, one of his aides, Lieutenant von Haufden, threw himself in front of the bullets, meant for him, in a gesture of loyalty if nothing else. Klaus von Stauffenberg was then shot, his last words declaring his love for his country. Further retribution was swift and far-reaching. In order to appease Hitler's rage, Himmler and the Gestapo swooped in on anyone with even the faintest hint of opposition to the Nazi regime and accused them of being involved. Perhaps the most well-known case was that of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the famed Desert Fox, who had achieved stunning victories in North Africa for Germany before being betrayed by Hitler. Rommel was allowed to take his own life in order to protect his status as a German hero and his family from further retribution. Having heard of the bomb's failure, von Tresco is reported to have left his post on the Eastern Front with a grenade which he detonated in his hand rather than be arrested by the Gestapo. One of those complicit in the conspiracy, although not directly involved, was Friedrich Fromm, chief of the reserve army which the plot relied upon, Fromm actually orchestrated the execution of von Stauffenberg, believing this would keep him in the Nazis' good graces. However, less than 24 hours later, when it was learned that Fromm had not acted to protect the Führer when he learned of the plot, he too was arrested, tried and executed. As for Hitler, he viewed his surviving of the bombing as proof that despite Germany's increasingly perilous situation, he and the Nazis were destined to win the war. Within nine months, he would take his life in his Berlin bunker as Soviet tanks trundled through the ruined buildings of the Third Reich's capital. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Next Tuesday, we'll be taking a look at what life was like for a soldier in the trenches during World War One.